So uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4 this morning. And so open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 4. You know, one of the, the, we're going to see this morning uh, in verses 12 through 22, we're going to see this morning, first off, the ministry of Jesus Christ and his beginning of his ministry. And we're not going to see his whole ministry, of course, um, but we're going to see the beginning of his ministry. And the beginning of his ministry, if you didn't know, started in actually Judea, south of, of the Galilean area. But, but truly, it began, it really began to grab traction and take traction in the Galilean area. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're also going to see how Jesus um, chose his disciples, I mean, my question to you this morning is, how did Christ call you? How did he call you into the kingdom? And how has he called you into serving with him in the kingdom of God? I think those are two very important aspects of the involvement that Jesus has had in our lives. Not only has he called us to him, salvation, redemption, all of that, But he's also called us in special ways, in serving with him. Now, Jesus is the lead. Jesus is the forefront. It's all Jesus all the way. And we follow him, just like he asks asks of the four, of the two sets of the brothers we'll look at this morning. They just follow him. That's all he says is follow me. He doesn't give them any any reasons why. He doesn't try and uh, uh, debate them. He doesn't give them any theology at all. But what he says is just follow me. Now, there's reasons why they do follow him. Not only is the spirit of God upon them, but there's some things that they see about Jesus before this time and this opportunity that causes them to say, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. And so I know every one of us has been called by Christ, but God also has a calling in our lives to him. And I think it's really important that we pray and we ask God, if he hasn't told you yet what your calling is, that you seek him, that you, that you get on your knees and you pray and you ask him, Lord, what is it you want me to do? What is it, Lord, that I can be uh, uh, co-laboring with you, God, that I can join you in the ministry of everyday ministry? It doesn't have to be necessarily a a title associated with it or, or anything of that nature or a name placed upon it, but God, how can I join you in ministry? So important. If God has already called you into something and he's already stirred your heart, then my encouragement to you is that you fulfill that call that God has placed on your heart, that you walk in the calling that God has given you. And so we're going to see this morning some important things about these areas, not only the area of ministry that is of Jesus in the Galilean area, but how he called these two sets of brothers Andrew and Simon, we know Simon as Peter, and then James and John, four pretty important guys within the ministry of the 12 apostles. So he's calling now and inviting, man, four of the 12 apostles to join him in ministry. And that is truly, man, just just remember this, that we are all a product of the calling of these 12 guys. We are all the benefactors and the byproducts of their their receiving and taking the call of Christ on their lives. And it's so important that we're we're in that lineage of sorts, beginning with the 12 apostles. So we're going to see the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We're going to see why did Jesus minister at this time. We're also also going to see why on earth did he begin it in Galilee and maybe not Jerusalem or maybe not his hometown, but then also how or the way Jesus calls those to serve him. And then when we say yes, understanding the cost of discipleship, what it really costs us to follow Christ. You may find already in your spiritual walk, if you've walked with the Lord 
any amount of time, whether it's one day or 60 years, you find that there are things that have maybe caused you to have to weigh out the cost of discipleship, to evaluate the cost of following Christ over our own desires, over our own wants, over things that seemingly are totally fine, nothing sinful about them at all, nothing wrong, quote unquote, right, air quotes here, nothing quote unquote wrong with those things at all. Those are good things. But I think Jesus, when he comes in our life, always gives us something that is better, amen? It's always better. I don't care what it is. You could be the president of the United States or you could be the leader of, of a Fortune 500 company. You could be Bill Gates or, or whomever, but there is nothing better nor greater than a life following Christ and serving Jesus. There's nothing better than that. And, 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 and truly, um, there are many of us in this room who are testimonies of that, that you have given up much, that you have had a life in seemingly in the world's idea, the world's sense, to where, man, you are a star. You are a rising star, a superstar, a, a climbing up the corporate ladder, perhaps. Maybe things that God is do, has been doing, even good things, like I said, but yet God has called you to something greater. God has called you to something better. And I believe when we heed the call of God in our lives, oh man, there is such joy. There is such peace. So I know for every one of us in this room, God has called us to something better. We'll see that Jesus actually had an early ministry in the Judean area, the lower part of Israel, even prior to the ministry in Galilee. Short-lived, one year. Sometimes we wonder, it's like, man, we venture into something, right? And then we wonder, man, Lord, you just dried it up really quick. Or Lord, you never allowed it to gain any traction. What's up with that? Were you not in it? Were you in it? Well, know this and be encouraged that Jesus initially, after being baptized, goes in the desert and comes back. Well, what does he do after that time? Well, he's in his hometown. He's in the area of Nazareth, or, and he's also in the area of Jerusalem, doing ministry, we might think. Not on the down low, but kind of quietly, you know? So much so that the Pharisees take notice of all the baptizing that he's doing. And those Pharisees were in Jerusalem. And so be encouraged that even though it might have been a short stint in a particular time of ministry, that God is still moving and God is still working. Amen? He's still doing those things. From this time, we're going to see all of these events beginning now, all the way through in the Gospel of Matthew, all the different great events of Jesus' Galilean ministry from uh, uh, the, the calling of his first apostles to minister with him, to the Sermon on the Mount, to Matthew's call, to the Jairus' daughter, to the 5,000 and the 4,000 being fed, all oh, the confession of Peter, the Mount of Transfiguration, and many other important events that we see are involved in this region, this area we call Galilee. So let's look first at verses 12 through 16. I'll read along. You guys follow in Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. When he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea. In the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. This is Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea beyond the Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, 
a light has dawned. So it's an interesting portion of scripture we read here already at the get-go. It's already been following to where Jesus has been in the desert and being tried. The devil tried to tempt him to do various things, and we studied that last week. Now understand that there's also been about a year's time, give or take, uh, as far as months go, but about a year's time between verse 11 in our text from last week as we ended and verse 12 at the beginning of our text this morning. So there's been about that year's time from verse 11 to verse 12. The location is an area called Galilee. I have on the screen for you an image that shows you the Galilean area. It shows you Capernaum. It shows you um, the Mount of Beatitudes, which we'll study next week. It shows you different areas, and we know that the area of uh, the Galilee is in the northwestern part of Israel, and opposite that at the very bottom would be what? The Dead Sea, right? And so that's what we're talking about this morning. Um, interesting at the time is I'm going to talk about the times of Christ and this area of Galilee. There were approximately 200 or so villages, if you can imagine that, around the Galilean area at the time of Jesus. The population was about 15,000 people, give or take, okay? Also, the word Galilee, maybe you wondered what that means. Well, the word Galilee just means region, it means district, or it means like a circle, okay? So it's either district, circle, or region. So this Galilean, this region of sorts, was, was a major area, even larger than Judea, the southern part itself, and even Samaria as well. The area of Galilee was, was and is still divided into three separate areas. There's the upper Galilee, which is north, and it has much more rainfall. It has little higher mountains and such like that. You then also have the lower Galilee, which is very mild in weather, but, and you also then have the Sea of Galilee. And if you've ever been to Israel, that area of Galilee is a beautiful place. It's a wonderful place to go. In fact, uh, man, it was great as I, myself and some of my brothers, we were able to swim in the Galilee, in the Sea of Galilee. And what a blessing that was, just to think. I mean, wow, you know, we're floating there in the water, and it's like, oh, this is where it was, man. This is where all the ministry took place. And we were staying in this one kibbutz there alongside this, the sea. And in the morning and the evening before, we just went out into the water. And we just waded in the water. And it was so, so peaceful and wonderful just to think. And we were all just talking about the Lord's ministry going on at his time. And, and now we're floating in this water. It was so cool. It was really awesome. This area of Galilee, this region, this district, had many rulers, okay? It, had, uh, it was taken over and, uh, by the Egyptians at one time. It was also taken over, as we know, Isaiah speaks about it in chapter 8, the, the captivity of the Israelites or those in Israel and, and him taking over. So the Assyrians also took it over as well. The Canaanites were in the land and ultimately, of course, the Israelites but the Gospels tell us quite emphatically that Jesus did the majority of his ministry in this region, in this district of Israel. As a youth, though, however, he was ministering mainly, or he lived in the lower part of the Galilean area, the lower part, a place called Nazareth, right? Or Bethlehem and those areas there closer to Jerusalem. But as an adult, we see by the map that it's a northwestern part of Israel that he did the majority of his ministry. In fact, Capernaum, it tells us in the scriptures, I read that that's where he withdraws to, he goes to, departs to that area from another place. And so that ends up being kind of his headquarters. It's kind of the, the hub of the spokes of ministry that Jesus has. So it's all happening there in Capernaum. You go to Capernaum today, and of course it's just ruins, 
However, it's pretty cool to know and to imagine and to pull out these scriptures and to think that, Lord, you, you were around this era. You walked possibly on all of these little streets. You, you might have looked at these particular places or this place of worship, a synagogue, for example, that would have been there. And so it's really cool as you go back. My encouragement is that if you've got an opportunity to go to Israel, go. Because it just makes the Bible and everything that we read so alive. And all the puzzle pieces fit right together. It really is. I still, and I know Gene and I and others that have gone with us, we, we, we have that vivid uh, a picture of the places we had gone to, Capernaum being one of them. The question is really, why Galilee? Well, early before Jesus, the place was so rural It was very rural, in fact, almost desolate, you might call it, barely populated. And it was mainly populated by the Greeks at one point, very heavily, but then there became a a colonization of the area that the Jews wanted to colonize the area, so they launched people out or planted people in the Galilean, that region of Israel, to repopulate that area for um, political reasons, but then also to establish even more the Jewish cultural reasons. So there's more of a population of Jews then coming into that area. In fact, the historian Josephus, if you know about him, the Jewish historian Josephus, he recorded again, there's about over 200 villages in the time, 66 AD, the time uh, that he recorded. And if you go there now, there's a lot of different um, buildup, of course. It's way more modern at this time. But the area of, of Galilee was influenced by many, many foreigners. That's why there was a, just all around it, there was a lot of foreigners, so there was a lot of pagan idolatry going on, as well as there was um, a lot of the culture, the Jewish culture there. It was all kind of mixed together. Interesting that this place was, was overseen by Rome, but not too specifically by Rome. They kind of let the Galilean area kind of go on its own. Okay, uh, the time of Herod the Great or his son Herod Antipas, they they oversaw that area as well. And but but that's why Galilee had its own identity. Okay, it's like if you talk to folks that are from the south or from the northeast or from the west coast or the Midwest, they kind of there's kind of like their own identity, is there not? Maybe by the way that you hear in their their voice, how they speak, right? You can definitely tell someone who's from Jersey versus someone who's from Southern California, right? It's so obvious, or someone from the deep south to someone who might be from Kansas or the Midwest or or Chicago or something, right? Those, those, Those states. So the same thing is with Galilee. That's why when many times when um, the apostles would speak, it's like, oh, you're, you're a Galilean, aren't you? Because there must have been some kind of inflection or accent or the way they spoke that depicted this is where you're from. So they had an identity of sorts there in the area if you came from the area of Galilee. And so the rule there, as I said, was not really heavy by Rome. They had some puppets people that were, not literally, of course, but, but leadership puppets that were, they were doing the thing. So Rome kind of left them alone to do what they wanted to do. They were kind of way up there, and, and from, from Jerusalem, it's like, ah, they just kind of left them on their own as long as they didn't cause any trouble. So there was never any anti-Roman things going on. No revolts or things like that happening in the times, plus because it was such a mixed population. And so in that too, the region was therefore stable, okay? Socially and economically, very stable. It didn't, it kind of stayed under the radar, okay? So understand, that's, how, that's where Jesus is going. I, want, I wanted to draw this picture of where Jesus is going and what is before him. In fact, right now, the major cities is one called Akko, There's another one called, of course, Tiberias, one Nazareth, a major city, and another one called Safed, which are all major modern cities today with much, much in population. So we can see pretty much 
why this region of Israel is called, in fact, the Galil of Goyim, or of the Goyim, which means Galilee of the nations. That's what they called it, Galil of the Goyim. Now, Goyim in Hebrew just means a non-Jew or a non-practicing Jew, okay? A Goyim, and so, or a Goy. So if you're ever in Jerusalem and you're referred to as, the, as a Goy, that means that you're just a non-Jew. It's nothing, in a sense, derogatory at all. It's just you're of the nations in that sense. So there's a lot of people groups in the area now, and there's a lot of people groups, especially at the time of Christ. How do I look at that? Well, I see this, and I can understand why Jesus is sent there by the Father, because it's a total mission field. It's a total mission field. The place is the valley of the Gentiles, the district or the region of the Gentiles. And because of that, Jesus has come to preach a message about God, about salvation. Well, this mission field, there were three things I think that he was called to do. One is fulfill prophecy, to bring light from darkness, and to bring life from death. We read that in the prophetic scripture from Isaiah in the Old Testament, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. We read that because it says, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. That light is who? Jesus. That light has come into the land of death, into the land of darkness, in that region of the nations that region of the Gentiles. Now, in verse 12, as we look at that, it says, you know, he withdrew from Galilee. I don't want you to think that he's hiding out. Jesus never, in a sense, hides out from anything or anyone. But that word withdrew in the Greek just simply means he departed for. He went into you and I might think, oh, I withdrew, meaning I'm hiding out or I'm going on below radar, kind of incognito. No, not at all. Following the knowledge of the imprisonment of John the Baptist, what happens? He, he now is commissioned in his mission to go to Galilee. John the Baptist had been baptizing. John the Baptist had been baptizing many who went all over. And this area of Galilee was also affected by the baptizing from John the Baptist. And so now Jesus goes into this place. So he, he departs there. He leaves there. But why is Jesus sent specifically to Galilee itself? Why, why didn't God send him into Jerusalem? Why didn't God send him somewhere else? Maybe to a, a deeper region near the, the Dead Sea, perhaps, in that lower part of, um, of Israel. Well, remember, prior to this time, we're told in the scriptures that he leaves from someplace. The place he leaves from is Nazareth. That's where he comes from. So that year he had been in Jerusalem doing ministry in the southern area, and then he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. And in Nazareth, we know his own words. Uh, he says in uh, Luke 4.24, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Unfortunately, the people, even after hearing him declare in the synagogue the words of God, they're like, man, he said some really good things, and wow, that was really amazing, but isn't he the son of Joseph the carpenter? How could we take him seriously? We've known him since he was a little guy. So how, why, isn't that Joseph's son? Well, they didn't understand him, and so therefore they didn't receive him. And so Jesus is like going, okay, it's time for me to go where I can be received, you know? And, and, and just as a real quick side note, I mean, so many times, you know, those, those guys who plant a church and whatnot, they, they will stay at that church for a number of years, and then all of a sudden the, move, the Lord moves them on. Maybe there, there's not a lot of people, or maybe the ground is too hard. Well, well you know what? Th th that's okay. 
That's okay, as long as the Lord is, is doing that leading. We see even with Jesus, and he being Jesus uh, couldn't get through to the people, could he? He wasn't about to make them. But he couldn't even get through to them. So it tells us he withdrew to the area of Galilee. So Jesus leaves Nazareth. He goes to Galilee to fulfill prophecy, but also because John had been imprisoned, we're told right there in verse 12, he'd been imprisoned by Herod. And so we know the fate of John, and we'll get into the fate of John later on. But he's sent to, to Galilee, I think, for three things. To continue the ministry of John the Baptist, to begin the ministry of his father, the one who sent him, and to fulfill prophecy. Those are things that I think that, that Jesus, there could be a lot more, but those are things that I see in the call of Christ in this area of Galilee, this region. Verse 13, it says that he went to live in Capernaum by the sea. There's a lot of other, there are other names for the Sea of Galilee. It's also called the Sea of Gennesareth or Gennesaret or Kinnisaret. Those are mainly Old Testament type of, of, of references to the Sea of Galilee. So I don't want you to get tripped up even as the Lord will use it in different translations in our Bible, King James, New King James. It might say those words. It means the Sea of Galilee. That's what we're talking about. And in our New Testaments, it also then speaks of the Sea of Tiberias or the Lake of Tiberias. Tiberias being one of the towns right there on the coast. And actually, if you look at that sea, it's not a, it's not a sea at all, is it? What do you and I equate a sea to be? Well, an ocean. It's not an ocean. But to the Jews of the time, they're not seagoing people. They're not seafaring people. To them, it's an ocean because it is a big place to them. To give you an idea, here's a, another image on that. There you go. You see the great sea on the left, which is the Mediterranean. That is truly what they considered the great sea. So in the Bible, when it references the great sea, we know they're talking about the ocean, the Mediterranean Sea. But when we talk, when they also refer to as the Sea of Galilee, just know they're talking about the Lake of Galilee, okay? It is a lake. It is 33 miles in circumference. It's 13 miles long. It's 8.1 miles in width, 64.4 square miles or at its fullest points. It's 141 feet deep. 686 feet below sea level. 686 feet below sea level. That happens to be the lowest freshwater lake in the world. Actually, it's the, 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 the let's see, maybe give my, my stats right. It's the lowest freshwater lake on earth and the second lowest lake on the earth only behind the Dead Sea. And, the, and, and that is, the Dead Sea is actually the lowest sea, body of water on the entire earth below sea level. So it's not a sea, in fact. It's just a large lake. But that large lake, if you've been on a lake at all, can be pretty dicey. How many of you guys have been on a big lake? And you think of Lake Michigan or Lake Superior. It kind of has its own climate sometimes, right? To where you get actual waves and you get, and you get bodies of water that, that, that are big and so forth. Well, in the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 4, verse 37, we know that as Jesus called his disciples to say, let's go to the other side, what happens? A great windstorm arose in verse 37. Waves were breaking over the boat, so the boat was already being swamped. Now, I remember as a kid, my dad and I went to visit my aunt in Colorado, a place called Four Corners, Durango, Colorado. And there was this lake called Lake Vallecito, which is in high in the mountains, okay? Probably about close to 8,000 feet in the mountains. And as you're on this lake, there is a, a, a gap within the mountain range, okay? It's kind of a lake that's within these mountains. And we would go fishing there in somewhat uh, many times when we'd be visiting. And so what would happen is, is that the wind... And the weather would come up through that big gap between the mountains. 
And I remember one time specific, only happened once, to where the wind came up and it got really cold. And this was in the summertime. And then the wind continued to howl even more. My dad's like, you know what? I think we need to go and kind of sit this one out. Let's go to the little diner, grab some lunch or grab something to eat or drink, and then let's kind of wait out this storm. I'm like, well, it's only wind, I thought. I was like probably eight, maybe seven or nine, somewhere that. So I didn't understand, but I said, okay, my dad says, let's go, let's go, you know? So we get the boat, and it's my uncle's boat, and we moor it, and we put it at the little dock there, and then all of a sudden, within about, oh my goodness, probably 30 minutes, that lake was transformed into a raging body of water. Uh, so much so that the dock, okay, was like a, this, coming off the shore and then the dock and then the boats along there. It got overturned because we had heard that you can get white caps, large waves upon this particular body of water when the wind comes up. And so my dad had that wisdom and discernment to go, you know what, it's, it's time to get off the lake. So the lake of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, no wonder, think about it, why the Jewish people would say it's like a sea. It's like an ocean because it, it, it can get so tumultuous. It can get so stormy. And none other than the apostles knew that firsthand, right? Because why? They were fishermen, for one thing. But then also, in the ministry of Christ, he said, let's go to the other side. And then, of course, this huge storm happens. Isn't that funny? Well, I don't know if it's funny, but isn't that just how the Lord works sometimes? God says, let's go to the other side. And he could have made it so calm and, and smooth sailing, right? Okay, it's a joke, smooth sailing. But you're not laughing. Come on. I'll even take a courtesy laugh. There you go. And no one more so than Brian and Jackie understand the, the waves and the wind patterns. But suffice it to say that when God says, let's go to the other side, the, he, could, he could bring some stuff in the middle of that ride, can he not? He can bring a storm. He can bring a tempest of sorts. He can bring something in the plan that would seemingly look, it's going to sink us or derail us at best. But we forget the first words of Jesus always. I think we always forget those when he says, let's go to the other side. It means we're going to get there. I've already said it. I'm God. I've said it. We're going to go, not me. I'm God, says Jesus. We're gonna, I'm going to meet you on the other side, guys. And he does. But sometimes in the middle of that journey, God brings the storm. God brings the tempest. God brings things that we didn't expect because, goodness, we're following God. We're following the Lord. We're doing his will. I'm reading my Bible. I'm coming to church. I'm tithing even. And yet there's a storm that's brewed in my life. What's happening, Lord? My encouragement to you on that note is do not forget the first words of Jesus. Let's go to the other side. Meet me there. Well, we then see that this storm had come up and we know the end of that story. But it also tells us that in verse 12, he's in the area or region of Zebulon and Naphtali. Know this, that's one of the two of the 12 original tribes of Israel. Jacob's sons, right? And in the giving of lots of land under Moses and the lots of land, they were given this northern area of Israel, which is in the Galilean area. And so that's why you have that up there, and that's why he says that up there, because that's the region, the place. And if you take a look at that, you're going to see the 12 tribes and what they were given. And there's Natali and there's Zebulun right at almost at the very top, with the most northern being the tribe of Dan, and then Asher right below it. 
So, so that's reference to, to give us a good reference point. Well, if we continue on, it's, we, we know why. Because it's pretty simple. It says in verse 14 why he's there. To fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. So, so what did the prophet Isaiah actually say? Well, in Isaiah chapter 8 and Isaiah chapter 9, they kind of go together in the sense to where 9 is a product of 8. Because in chapter 8 of Isaiah, Isaiah speaks of the taking over and the, the, of the Assyrians coming into the land and taking them captive and all the destruction and mayhem that, that was caused upon the children of Israel. In fact, Isaiah 8.22 says, They will look toward the earth and only see distress, darkness, and gloom of the affliction, and they will be driven into thick darkness. Isaiah 8.22 so actually, if you look at it this way, as I see it, the prophecy in Isaiah 9, being a product of Isaiah 8, what was happening, is really a prophetic word of hope. It's a, and if you read further in Isaiah chapter 9, there's a very famous verse that we all know about later on or midway in the chapter, and we'll get to that. But it's a promise of hope. That's why Jesus is being sent to the Galilean area because he's the promise of hope. The hope of where the greatest concentration of Gentiles in Israel would be located. That in the region, the district of the, the sea. The sea of Galilee, in other words. The region of the nations. The region of the Gentiles. And so we see that there's a specific purpose and plan that God has in sending Jesus to that place. And I dare say that God has the same kind of plan for our lives as well. The the trick is, is in figuring out what that plan is. Where do you want to send me, Lord? What do you want to do in my life? Well, the key, I believe, to that understanding is you got to hear from God. So how do you hear from God? You stay close to God. Well, how do you stay close to God? You read his word. You pray. You you seek the Lord and you ask him. I believe that if you ask the Lord, Lord, how do you want to use me? I want to be used. I don't believe that's asking amiss. The Bible says that you receive not because you ask amiss. You don't act ask rightly. You're asking for your own things to be done, your own will, your own plans, your own things to be carried out. Ask what my will is for your life. And I think if we approach the Lord thus, that we ask the Lord, I don't think he has any problem with that at all. I think it's, Lord, what is it you want me to do for you? Lord, how how can I serve you, Lord? How can I be joined in ministry with you? How can I be joined with ministry with you at our church? How can I be joined with you in the things of missions within our church? Those kinds of things. Lord, what is it that I can do for you? I don't think God's going to shy away from saying, oh man, keep seeking me. Keep seeking me. I have something special for you. Sometimes he wants us to continue seeking to get closer and develop that practice and that that, that increased desire of, oh, I haven't heard from you yet, Lord, but I know it's going to be great. I know it's going to be awesome. So I'm going to keep seeking you more fervently, more passionately. I'm going to just come to you and persevere and be persistent about you, Lord. Sometimes that's the answer. That's what he wants us to do. Conversely, he might say, okay, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm glad you asked because this is what I want you to do. I've been waiting for you to ask. Bam, that's what I want you to do. Sometimes it's like that as well. So it's for hope. Think about it. This is the first place truly that God has chosen to have his son go and minister. Think about that. The first place where his ministry begins. The first place to where there will be light from darkness, life from death. God knew the impact of the, of that Jesus would make in the area and the region of Galilee. And I think as God has come into our lives, God has realized and God has known that there's an impact through you that God wants to do. He wants to 
impact your life and my life for the purpose of the kingdom of God. It's just not to be saved. It's just not to sit in our salvation, in other words. But it's truly to be impacted by God and then be used by God in a powerful way. So God knew. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knew that by sending Jesus to this place would begin an amazing, an amazing movement for him, right? For the Lord. People would come to him. So they were the first to see the Lord's light. They were the first to be a part of his ministry. Remember the 5,000 are fed, the 4,000 are fed, all these people, as we get into the next verses, um, uh, in in, in verses uh, 23 to the end of this chapter, later on, like next week, we'll, we'll see that there are crowds and multitudes of crowds and crowds following Christ. Because they're, they're witnessing all the miracles. They're witnessing everything that's going on. There's a lot of people at this time in that area. And the primary amount of people are like, like, like uh, 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 Gentiles. But if we go on in, in Isaiah 9 and we look at verses 6 and 7, this is, this is the hope that God is sending to the, to the world Initially there in, Gen- in uh, Galilee. For a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. His name will, he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast. And his prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Man, can I get a little amen out of that? See, that's the hope that God is sending through Jesus Christ into this area, into this region. Of course, the big picture is for all of us, but specifically in context, it's like that's where it's beginning. And God is faithful to complete a work that he's begun in your life too. Don't ever sell it short. Don't ever sell it short. God is faithful to complete that of which he's begun in you. He's faithful to do that. Just as he's faithful to do this work here as well. So this is the mission of Jesus. To go into places of darkness and bring light. To go into places of sorrow and bring joy. To go into places of desperation and bring hope. And to go into places of death and bring life. Is that not our commissioning too I mean we don't save anybody but we're still to be light to other people we're still to be bringing hope to other people we're still to 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 bring joy into other people's lives that's our role as well of what we've been commissioned to do that we're not to be closet Christians and just stay kept and truly then in a sense withdraw or hide out or be under the radar Uh, We don't want to be under the radar Christians. Time is too short, guys. Time is way too short. Well, and it didn't stop with Jesus, did it? It continued on with the 12, and it continues on today with you and me. We are, as I said earlier, the the lineage of these 12. We're the the quote-unquote missions team to take up the mantle, the responsibility of what the apostles laid out originally in the region of the nations. I don't know. It seems like there's a lot of people that we were talking this morning at Real Life with the guys, and man, oh, man, it seems like there's more people, I was told, that don't believe in God could care less about the things of God, and they're totally okay with it. Can you believe that? At least in the past, there would be some kind of conviction. There would be some kind of, oh, man, maybe I should consider this, but nowadays there's not even any consideration. I'm living my life. I'm making my money. I'm doing whatever I want to do, and God, okay, I know of him, but he doesn't concern me. He doesn't concern me. And believe me, it's starting off at a very young age. 
because that's what the world's influence is. Like the influence around Galilee was, was all the, those, those Gentile nations. The same kind of thing happens to, even at young ages, the influence of the nations are affecting God's people. They really are. Well, Jesus was sent into this place to be light, to be hope, to be joy, and to show the love of the Father. That's why he was sent there. To be missionaries, in a sense, for us as well. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That was his commissioning, in a sense, to the apostles. In verse 17, we see that Jesus is keeping the main thing, the main thing. It says that from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus didn't like just continue the message of John the Baptist, but I believe here he's confirming the message of John the Baptist. It's a real confirmation because Jesus is saying the same thing as John the Baptist. And this message started in Judea a year before. John 4, 1 tells us when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. So this isn't his first time there, but it's his first time in the official capacity, if you will, there, the commissioning by God to go forward. Jesus had a purpose to go to Galilee, but also he had a purpose to go somewhere else before Galilee. Do you know that? He went into Samaria to go to Galilee. In fact, my Bible says he had to. You might have a New King James James Version which says he needed to go through. Take a look at your Bibles, depending on the version you have and how it's said. Don't just believe me. But it does say that he had to go through. Why? Because there was one woman there that he knew that he would meet at the well, right? The Samaritan woman at the well. And he shares with her about living water, that she will not thirst again. And from that, she believes. And from that, the whole town believes. And so much so, they invite him to stay two days. They go, oh, would you stay with us, teacher? Would you stay with us? He's like, sure, I'll stay with you. And I'll continue to share the Lord with you. Now, from that moment then, he makes his way into Galilee. Verses 18 through 23, it says this. As he began walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people or fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, they saw two other brothers, James and John, of, a son of Zebedee, or James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, with their father, preparing their nets, and he called them, or mending their nets, maybe your translation says. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Follow me. Again, that's all Jesus said to these guys. Jesus had already met Andrew and Simon, or Peter, we know him as, while they were with John the Baptist in John chapter 1. And another time in the Sea of Galilee when he said, hey, hey, can I use your boat? You remember that? Can I use your boat and and talk to these people? So these guys had already seen Jesus. They've already witnessed the, the things that he'd been doing. So it wasn't like just a cold call, if you will. But it was like they'd seen him. He'd been there previously, evidently. And they see this thing going on. And now he says, follow me. And it tells us in the scriptures that they immediately drop what they're doing, just like Levi, right? Matthew, the tax collector, immediately drops what they're doing and they follow Jesus. No concern, no second thought, but they just leave and follow Christ. What did Jesus see or what did Jesus do and how did these guys respond, these these brothers, these two sets of brothers? Well, one is Jesus saw. Jesus is always seeing. Jesus is always Looking, Jesus is always looking for those who want to serve him. He's always looking for those who want to join him in ministry. 
who want to join him in the ministry of the gospel. He's always looking. He's always seeing. He's walking along the Galilee with his guys, and it's like, or at that point alone, all of a sudden, oh, I remember those guys. I remember them. I used his boat, in fact. Something about him. So Jesus saw, and Jesus is always looking for those who will serve him. We know that they were fishermen, so they were already doing something. They were busy doing their own work. Charles Spurgeon says they were busy in a lawful occupation when he called them to be ministers. Our Lord does not call idlers, but fishers, right? Isn't that good? God doesn't call the idle. We're just sitting on our hands. But he calls fishers, men and women, who are already acting. One of the things I always preach about, I guess, my little soapbox is, a lot of folks say, I don't know where to serve. I don't know what to do. I say, get involved doing something. Begin somewhere, right? Because in the serving, God in that thing, and you may not be called to it, quote unquote, but in that serving, God is gonna show you amazing things. And you're gonna go, oh man, you guys do this? Oh man, that, oh, I can do that too. And then God moves you out of that particular serving capacity and into something else, maybe something that you just, man, floats your boat. You gotta be involved in something because God doesn't use idlers. He uses those who are already active doing something. Well, he called them as well. That's two things. He saw them and he called them. He just said, follow me. He didn't give them any long thing like I'm doing this morning. He didn't give them any long speech. He just said, follow me. And they followed him. Were so much so that their response was, well, their new calling, Jesus said, uh, would be fishers of men instead of fishing for fish, right? Sometimes God will already use the things we're involved with to further his glory, Right? These guys were fishermen. They understood the connection to be fishers of men. Catching fish in nets, catching men in the net of Christ. They're already kind of used to that. Their response was immediate. They didn't like, well, Lord, I need to bury my father first. Or, well, Lord, I need to take this consideration first. Well, how many of us do that? Okay, I'll be the first. I do. (laughs) We do that, right? We have to weigh things out when God has said, follow me. The cost of discipleship, what had happened? With the first set of brothers, they left their nets and followed him. And the second set, they left their boat and their father and followed him. So there's, there's a cost here, leaving something that the world might think is beneficial or is a good thing or whatnot. Their business, they were all, they were all thriving in the fishing industry, these two brothers, in fact, Mark 1.20 says, immediately he called them and, he, and they left their father Zebedee in a boat with the hired men and followed him. Very profitable business then, the fishing for these two families. The idea isn't here what these men were so much as what would Jesus make them into. Think about that. They were fishers of fish, But Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. Do you get that? Let me say that again. I'm looking at it kind of like, ooh. It's not so much what we are doing now, but what Jesus is going to make us into. Okay? These guys were fishers of fish. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Fishing for people instead of fishing for men. It's Jesus, in other words, as we close this out. It's Jesus who does the picking, the choosing. It's Jesus who picks us or chooses us to do the work, and it's Jesus who qualifies us by his Holy Spirit to do that same work. It's Jesus who commissions us to fish for men's souls, 
to win them over to God. And Jesus, when he commissions us, we must follow him. We're to separate ourselves from the things of the world and fully focus on Christ. Be attentive to Jesus. We must yield ourselves to Jesus if we're to follow him, submit our lives to him, follow Christ. We must be in love with Jesus to serve Jesus and be used by Jesus. We must love him, passion. I find there's a lot of people that know God and, and, and follow God, but it's really hard for me sometimes to, to kind of look and say, well, Lord, do they really love you? Do they really love you, Lord? So much so that if you ask them to do something, they would do it without second guessing, without any reservation, but just say, yes, Lord. Because when you love someone, you're willing always to do for them. That's what I found out in my marriage. Thursday night, my wife and I, Jean, we celebrated 32 years I, oh, oh, yeah, no, I'm not looking for that. I'm just, I'm just like thinking, 32 years, man. It's a long time. It's longer than some of you have been alive, I can see in the room. But 32 years, that's how it is too with a, with a marriage. You know, when you love someone, you are willing to do for them when they ask you. My wife asks me to do something all the time that I'm like, oh, oh, man. I'll just come in the house after bringing something in from the, from the car, the refrigerator, and the garage, and then she'll forget to tell me about something else that needs to be received, gotten again from the refrigerator and the garage. And it's usually cold or dark, and I've got to reopen the garage door again. And But okay, <laughs> because I love you. And you ask me to get ice cream, I'll go. <laughs> but suffice it to say, when you love someone, you will do for them. Same goes with Jesus. So Jesus has called every one of us in this room today. That's every one of you here today. He's called every one of you here to be fishers of men, no matter what we're doing at presently. Whether you're fishing or you're mending nets, we must follow Jesus, guys. We must follow Jesus and follow him with all, our, with all love and diligence and faithfulness and desire. Jesus has actually called every one of us to join him in ministry. Every one of us here to not sit on our salvation or be closet Christians, but to join him in ministry. So as he's done that, we're to serve him and we're to serve him joyfully. No matter if you are diapering a baby's bottom in our nursery, to the worship team, to teaching from a pulpit, leading a Bible study, whatever. We're called to serve him and serve him with joy. Because we get to serve with a king. We get to serve alongside Jesus. No different than the apostles did. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your word and thank you for this time. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen, amen you guys. Hey, if anybody needs prayer this morning,